This is our last talk in the Docker in production track. Thank you for coming. Um, we have representatives from Franklin American Mortgage Company here with us. They're going to talk about disruption from within, how Franklin American is doing innovation in the enterprise. So let me welcome up here uh, Sharon Frazier, Vice President of Innovation, and Don Bauer, also known as DevOps Don on Twitter, lead develops, I'm sorry, lead DevOps engineer. Let's give him a hand. Would you like a clicker? Yes. <laughs> okay, hello. <laughs> With the lights, it's really hard to see, but that's okay. We got an empty room, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, Sharon Frazier, oh, when I touched the, the mic. Um, just a little bit about um, what I do, I'm actually a, an entrepreneur in corporate America. Um, I've been involved in a lot of startup and early stage companies most of my, my career and um, jumped into corporate America because I looked at the opportunity with the company and uh, the, the ability to disrupt the industry uh, from within the company. So I actually get to run a startup inside an organization and it's the best job in the world. And I'm Don Bauer. Um, I'm a community leader for Docker in Nashville. Um, I was brought on as a DevOps engineer at Franklin American Mortgage to help them build out their new platform um, to facilitate their microservices strategy, uh, their DevOps desires, and uh, everything we wanted moving forward. Um, I've been using Docker for about three years, uh, two of which has been in production um, at two different companies actually now too. So I've been a software developer most of my professional career uh, over the last uh, two years or so um, is kind of when I transitioned into, into DevOps and it's, it's been a heck of a ride. <laughs> Fair enough, so uh, let's just talk about innovation for a minute. It's something that we hear a lot about, right? Everybody's doing it or everybody wants to do it. It's important, um, but it, means something different depending on who you're talking to. So I wanted to uh, give you my definition. Um, first of all, I'm going to say that innovation isn't about the latest and greatest tech. I mean, it can be, and I know it's a hell of a thing to say at a tech conference, but um, any tech's only as good as what you do with it, whether it's new or legacy or, or whatever. But in innovation instead, you gotta look from your customer's point of view. It's gotta be enabling something that's new and important to them. Just because you've got a new product or a new feature doesn't mean that it actually matters to your customer. And if it doesn't matter, then you no longer stay relevant. Um, another way I describe my job is it's my job to make sure that the company is still relevant 10 years from now. So, the first challenge we wanted to address was actually our competitive position with pricing. Um, now any company that's greater than 10 minutes old has some sort of legacy, whether it's processes or systems or culture. Um, some of, so some of our oldest tech uh, was in our lock engine. Some of our most complicated tech was in our, our lock engine. And for those of you not in the mortgage industry, what a lock engine is, it's, it's where our customers come to get prices about our loans, our products. So it's incredibly important to us and to them um, because if we don't lock loans, actually we're, we're, we're out of business. So we set about, the team set about um, to reimagine locking. So we didn't wanna just recreate what we had, we wanted to look at it from a completely different uh, point of view. What we did know was that we wanted to deliver a modern app that was the most dependable, the most hardened, and the most flexible. We wanted to give the business the agility that they've been missing and they've been wanting. We knew also that it was gonna be the beginning of our platform. It's gonna be the foundation that we were gonna grow from because we've got a lot of things that we wanna tackle. We knew that, that it had to uh, embody the quality of service characteristics your security, your adaptability, high availability, um, all your abilities. We also knew that we wanted to deliver in a continuous 
uh, or operate in a continuous delivery fashion. We knew that we wanted to be able to stand whatever we were creating up anywhere. We didn't want to be limited to any sort of um, data center or platform. Um, so in essence, we knew we had to create our own foundation that we could work from, which meant we were going to eat our own dog food, which was actually a really good thing. <laughs> all right. Your show. So um, with everything that Sharon just said, all the considerations we, we had going into this, um, it was uh, important for us to come up with a solution, like she said, where we could eat our own dog food, um, remain agile, but we didn't have a big team, so we, we had to take all of that into consideration as well. Um, so we started looking at solutions, we started looking at options. Uh, at Franklin American Mortgage, from the day I started, they've had a strong focus on doing things right rather than doing them fast. And we kind of wanted to do both, but we wanted to make sure we made the right choice no matter what. Um, so we wanted to meet our current and future needs with what we went with. Um, we ended up landing on Docker Enterprise. Uh, unlike other options at the time, um, it was going to be simpler to maintain. And more importantly, um, I mentioned our small team. And we needed something that, that we could maintain with, with one or two engineers over, over the life of the platform, at least uh, at the beginning. But we also needed that same level of service isolation. And so Docker EE let us isolate uh, our services um, between a staging environment, test environment, and production environment all within a single cluster. Um, that's how we, we landed there. There were other options like Kubernetes that, uh, even though they were more feature rich at the time, um, they were hard to maintain and they didn't offer that same level of uh, segregation. Um, with Swarm, it simplified how we were going to deploy our stuff and it ease processes like user adoption uh, across our organization. Um, and again, it was just much more simpler to maintain than a lot of the other schedulers. So with Docker EE, it enabled us to move forward um, with something else that we wanted to adopt with our new software strategy, and that was continuous delivery. So we identified that as how we wanted to move forward. Um, but once we started looking at the tools that were out there, there wasn't really anything that integrated with UCP or DTR or Notary and anything more than a generic capacity. Um, we had some specific needs that we, we really wanted to tackle um, for, for some of our forward-looking stuff, um, especially with Docker Content Trust and image signing. Uh, so after we looked through the process of customizing uh, some of the other options that were out there with plugins, things like that, we, we made the decision to build instead of buy. So once we decided to build, uh, we set out to make the tool that we built um, not only a, a CD management tool, but uh, something that would be a single pane of glass into our cluster and into the state of our ecosystem uh, at any point in time. And it's really enabled much of our success. So when we first launched it, it was only running about 30 services. It was only managing three environments, and we were doing maybe two to four deployments a day. Um, funnily enough, the uh, uh, delivery was the first deliverable uh, delivered to the company by the innovation team. Um, and that's just fun to say. So, so delivery is pretty cool, and I could talk about it all day. Um, but I won't. I wanted to talk about the more important things about what we did, which is how we decided to do what we were going to do. Um, we had to define DevOps within the company, what it meant to us, because uh, you talk to people here or just about anywhere in the community, DevOps means something different to just about everybody. So we had to define what DevOps meant for us, and then we had to define our vision. So for us, DevOps is way more than just simply automating the software development lifecycle and simplifying remedial tasks. Uh, for us, DevOps is about breaking down the barriers and removing teams, uh, removing teams from their silos, and breaking, you know, getting, getting everything set up for collaboration and communication uh, across across those teams. Um, we wanted developers to be thinking about 
the operations required to run their applications, and we wanted the, the ops team to be thinking about the developers when they were setting up their stuff. So I personally feel that if a DevOps team is ever 100% truly successful, uh, at the end of that success, there will no longer be a need for that team. But luckily, technology's moving pretty fast, so we get new challenges and stuff, so any DevOps engineers in the audience, I don't think you guys have to worry. Uh, as for our vision, um, that's what we set out to define next. So these are the pillars of our vision uh, that we've brought into our DevOps culture. Uh, pillars are uh, visibility, simplify, experiment, and standardize. They're not necessarily in that order. I messed that up. But uh, they're now not only the pillars of our DevOps vision, but they're actually now pillars of our DevOps culture. Uh, when we think about decisions we're making moving forward with, with anything we're doing within our IT ecosystem, uh, we look at it through, through these lenses now to, to make sure it's enabling us to do what we set out to do in the first place. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not gonna cover things like if we went waterfall, if we went agile, if we're using Scrum, um, cabs, ARBs, that kind of process stuff. We, we just don't have enough time for that. Um, but instead, I'm going to focus on, on the pillars of uh, our vision and how Docker and delivery have enabled us to accomplish what we have. So the first pillar we tackled was visibility. Uh, visibility is the foundation of our DevOps culture uh, at Franklin American. There should never be the question asked, what are you guys doing over there? But more importantly than that, visibility across teams. It, it enables uh, communication. It enables uh, cross-functional growth on, on both sides or all sides uh, between your, your developers, your ops teams, your administrators. Um, and it creates a, an environment that fosters personal and professional growth. And you know, that's, that's been very important for, for us as a company. It, the other big thing is it helps, it helps to break down the silos. I touched on that a little bit earlier, but it, it does help break down those silos. And once you get the teams talking to each other, um, it, it kind of never goes back to the old way. And that's what, we, what we've wanted to see. So as we continue evolving as a company, um, visibility being the foundation of our, our DevOps uh, culture has, has really started to, to spread through everything else. So now it's taken into consideration through uh, all processes and, and changes and projects that are happening within the company, not just within IT. So the first thing we tackled under this pillar was monitoring. Um, once your service is deployed, uh, now what? So we utilized the UCP API for, for the basic container monitoring, um, provided a simple dashboard within delivery to, to just quickly identify healthy services. Uh, we implemented the Elk stack for you know, free open source log aggregation uh, using FileBeat deployed across our cluster. And uh, we integrated with uh, a company called Instana for our APM and kind of uh, infrastructure monitoring. Um, and they actually did a talk yesterday uh, in the ecosystem track. I hope you guys got to see it. But if you didn't, um, they do have a vendor booth in the expo hall. And they, you, you'll, you'll want to talk to them for sure. Um, so, when I was a systems engineer uh, working for Charter Communications, uh, this was about eight years ago, my partner used to tell us, um, if you can't monitor it, then it never happened. It's kind of, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it, uh, kind of a thing. If you don't know it went down, then um, you know, is it really down? So. This is a tenant that we've adopted and um, you know, we've brought into the culture and it's something that I've personally lived by ever since as a, as a developer, as an infrastructure engineer, and now as a DevOps engineer. Um, and as most of us know, uh, root cause analysis is one of the hardest parts uh, when, it, when it comes to monitoring, especially when you're triaging some sort of outage. Uh, so within, within our dashboard, we built in links to uh, UCP, to Kibana, uh, to Instana for, for all of these services when an event does happen. So we can link you to all the relevant information at the same time, uh, rather link our developers. Um, and then we added real-time notifications in our Slack channel. We have a nag mode that will uh, 
constantly make sure you're aware if it's a critical service or a prod service. And uh, thankfully, we actually uh, we've got that down now, so we haven't had too many of those. Knock oh. on wood. <laughs> yeah, <Come on. laughs> Sharon's over there knocking. <laughs> Uh, so the next thing was pipelines, and so this is a, a widely abused term, um, and I'm not going to try to necessarily define it here, but what we wanted was a, a simple way of getting services uh, from, from development all the way to production. So we needed our tool uh, to, to do that, give us one way in, but we also needed to be able to see visually what was deployed to every environment for every service at all times. And so we created this dashboard. This is just a little snippet of it. Um, but it, it shows you the, the current running version, where it's running, whether or not it's healthy. That's you know, the background color. Um, and the same dashboard allows release managers and stuff to see what's going on and promote if they, if they need to. Most of it's automated, but you, you have the manual option as well. So, it enables and enforces us to, or it enables and enforces the one way to production paradigm that we wanted to follow. Um, we don't want anybody, you know, testing it in prod, uh, anything like that. Um, and this is, this has allowed us to do that. Um, as we started to introduce user sandboxes, we enabled our pipeline systems to uh, automatically update those user sandboxes if they were running the same service that just got upgraded. Once it gets deployed to prod, all the user sandboxes would get upgraded as well. Um, but we'll touch on that more here in a little bit. Uh, the same view, like I said, also enables the release managers to, to promote new services if they need to. If we have a, a manual QA portion, um, the QA engineer can go in and sign off and uh, move it on to the next stage. So everything follows the same process to get, get to production. So the next thing, and this is everybody's favorite thing right here, is compliance. Um, so a lot of companies have to follow SOC, ISO, PCI, NIST, I mean, the list goes on. Um, for, for us, with, with DTR that you get with Docker EE, the image scanning really helped us check the box um, so we could immediately address and identify those concerns, and the security team can quickly go in see the scan results, they can look at all the images, they can handle the updates, um, and you know, we, we just maintain that visibility across the teams. Um, it's also allowed us with their API to enforce uh, a baseline so um, we can automate that part of the process where if, if there is anything critical that needs to be remedi remediated, it will get remediated before it's promoted or deployed anywhere. Um, their API, uh, has allowed us to, to automate a lot of that process, and they've, uh, they've made it really simple to, to extend and tweak it as well. So the next pillar um, was you know, simplification, or to simplify. And developers, in my experience, or at least good developers, are lazy. Um, Developers will create services and interfaces using, you know, common standards. Uh, I used interfaces in the wrong spot there, but, um, you know, common standards, interfaces, and patterns. And as we started to move forward with our, our DevOps initiative, we thought, well, well, why don't we do the same thing with everything that we're doing? Um, so the first part of that was actually implementing D&D. &D. And no, I don't mean Dungeons and Dragons. But um, I do mean Docker and Docker. Uh, have, has anybody in the audience used Docker and Docker? I'm, wow, I'm actually kind of surprised. There's, uh, there's more than I thought. <laughs> um, well, for those of you that haven't, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's exactly like it sounds. It's running a Docker container to run a Docker engine to then run some more Docker containers in there. But um, the, I have... I have hallway tracks for this if, uh, if you, you want to know more about it. I won't get too deep. Um, but at this point, you might be wondering how running Docker in Docker actually helped us simplify anything. So the first thing was it comes back to us eating our own dog food, um, as well as the need to maintain the isolation within, within a single cluster. So we're using the single cluster to help facilitate this workflow, but that cluster might also have production services running on it. 
So Docker and Docker allows us to add that second layer of isolation. And it also made it so we could, it gave us a path where we could enforce and honestly simplify a whole lot of how we handle builds and deploys. So we started with a base image. And in that base image, we put all of our build scripts, all of our deploy scripts, um, and then any tooling that might be needed to push artifacts to repositories or uh, move them somewhere else that they needed. Our DTR image signing stuff is all in there as well. Um, and then we would extend that base image based on the project language. So if you were running a build for a Java language, you might need Maven, you might need JUnit to run your testing. We were able to centralize all that in one spot and then extend it. And then if we have to apply an update, we have to, to update a build script, something like that. We only update that one spot. Our CI process trickles it down to all the other images. And these are single use images. So they only exist for five minutes at a time. Once we roll out the new scripts or the new keys, whatever we have to do that way, we're, we're guaranteed within five minutes and nobody's using the old scripts anymore. So it's, it's allowed us to simplify that process. So we're not maintaining build scripts and deploy scripts across 300 repositories. We just maintain them in one spot and everybody follows a standardized pattern. Um, the, the other big thing with it, like I said, it's, it's single use. Um, it, it's allowed us to, to really dramatically scale out how we do our deployments. Um, all of these can run, you know, we can run 25 concurrently, we can run, run one at a time, uh, doesn't matter that way. But now that we don't have to worry so much around bringing the tooling into the repositories so, so these guys can run their builds, um, it's, it's simplified the management of that and it's also made our images a lot smaller in the long run. The next thing is standardization. And I mean, this kind of ties back into simplification a lot. Um, you know, as the slide says, naming things is hard. And I'm sure a number of us in the room have been pulled into meetings because we got to figure out how to name this next thing because it conflicts with something else we've already got. And um, nobody, nobody likes that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we started with our images. Um, and so we kind of followed the same model as we did with D&D. We started with a base image. Um, we actually have a couple because not everything runs on Alpine, unfortunately. And uh, with that base image, we, any of the tooling and stuff that we need or require for compliance reasons or standardization reasons, we're able to put it in there. And then we extend that again for, for the languages and runtimes that are going to be used by the applications uh, that'll get deployed as containers using these images. Um, so the same thing works there where the updates to the base images trickle down. From a security uh, perspective, if we identify a vulnerability, all we have to do is update the base image and trigger builds downstream, and, and we've got that vulnerability covered across all of the projects. Um, and, you know, again, it just it simplifies everything. So they're just going from one of these base images, injecting their artifact, and they're good to go. The other thing was metadata. So we standardized our, our metadata um, in our Docker files. So there's a standard template that everybody gets when they start. Um, there's a skeleton project that they basically just clone. And with this, with the metadata, what we've done is we've identified some very important pieces of information that we commonly need, especially from an operations perspective uh, when it comes to troubleshooting and triage. Uh, so we track the, the artifact ID, the build date, um, the hash of the uh, VCS commit that was, that was made, um, and the semantic version. Uh, there's some other stuff in there as well. This is, this is a little bit trimmed down for this because it's a lot of information to put on the slide. Um, but with how our logging and stuff works, any log entry that we, we pick up, all of this information is included. And we've, we can, of course, see it inside of UCP. We can see it inside of our delivery tools, um, any of the, the monitoring that we've got around it as well. All that metadata is going to be attached to the running image. So if we have an issue with it, we can verify what semantic version it is. And we've got the exact repository URL and get hash of that commit so we can immediately go identify where the issue is. Um, it's really simplified the, the triage process and, um, you know, it's just, 
I don't, I, I'm not sure I can really say any, any more about that, but we, we do get um, you know, very, uh, very good feedback from the devs. They no longer have to look anywhere to try to figure this stuff out, because the last thing you want them doing is shelling into the container and, and digging around trying to figure out what version it is. So next we moved on to the Swarm templates, and our goal here um, was we wanted the templates to be simple. Uh, I know, uh, I don't know how many people in here um, use Swarm versus any of the other uh, orchestrators or schedulers out there, um, but it's the same as a Docker Compose file, which I'm sure you probably know. Um, but we wanted them to be simple, and we wanted them to be deployable using Docker Compose on a local machine but the same template could be used on our cluster to deploy that service to the cluster. Um, delivery helps us out with this a little bit, so it'll auto-prefix uh, things like networks and volumes based on the environment, um, but no actual change is required in the Swarm template. Uh, part of what's enabled us to do that is the standardization of environment variables surrounding that, so we can, we can tweak how, how it gets exposed if it's exposing a public endpoint um, and you know, some, of the, some of the namespacing stuff, but that's all handled through environment variables so the, the actual template doesn't change. Um, this ensures that we've got identical configurations between what's running in test, what's running in staging, and what's running in prod. Um, the other big thing that this has really helped us with is when we do bring a new developer into the fold, it really simplifies the ramp up time because they, they can just come in, they can Docker compose up the same template that we're using to run these deployments. So when, when these do get deployed, I mentioned our delivery system does some auto prefixing. So here you've got a, a set of volumes that are all deployed for our Zookeeper service, but you'll see four different environments called out there. And then the same thing on the network side, um, that's all for our Zookeeper network, but there's one for uh, there's one for staging, there's one for prod, and there's one for test. So they're all isolated and kept away from each other, and if uh, you know, you've got the right rights, you can see them, but um, using the collections, anybody else who logs into that cluster wouldn't otherwise. Um, but it sets it all up the same way for everybody. So at this point, we've, we've covered the first three pillars, and they've enabled us to tackle our fourth pillar, um, which I don't want it, to, it's not the most important, but in terms of innovation, it is incredibly important. We wanted to enable our developers to fail fearlessly, but fail fast. And this is, this is something I say quite often, so anybody who's talked to me here at the conference, I'm sure I've probably said it once, <laughs> at least. Um, but we wanted to enable our pillar of experimentation. Developers should never fear failure, and for that matter, matter neither should, should engineers. We should be able to try new things quick, we should be able to evaluate them, and if they're not gonna work, we should be able to fail quick. So our first thing with that was sandboxes. Um, we did single, user click, or single click user sandboxes, so any user can go into the system, and they could say, hey, I need, I need these two groups of services, and I need this one to be at this version, and they click a button and they get their very own private sandbox within our cluster that they can then interact with and develop against without having to run 87 services on their local machine. Um, the, the isolation and the nature of how, how Docker EE and Swarm sets this up is, has really allowed us to do that. Um, we, can, we can copy any running environment in minutes, um, whether, whether it's running 30 services or 120. And uh, with the, uh, the role-based access controls, we've been able to lock it down. So if Joe deploys his sandbox, I can't do anything against that. That's Joe's sandbox um, and vice versa. Joe's sandbox can't talk to mine or prod or any of the other environments for that matter. So like I said, sandboxes can be deployed with a single click, um, but they don't have to be. You can customize it. So this is just a loop of, of kind of what that looks like. Um, but the other thing I touched on briefly earlier is they're self-updating. So any of these where I haven't specified a specific version, if tomorrow uh, three of those are updated and a new version of those services go out to production, 
the system will go back to my user sandbox that I just deployed, and it'll automatically update those running services to match the, the latest version that was just launched into Prod. So this has allowed us to operate uh, temporary sandboxes used for one-off testing as well as long-term sandboxes used for developers using the same mechanism, the same interface, the same everything else. So I touched on failure, and failure is easily one of the most important things for any engineer or develop developer, um, and it's what separates the good ones from the bad ones. Failure is how we as human beings just learn best. Um, so by adopting and integrating the other pillars of our, our vision, um, we've created a, a platform that allows us to fail because there is no success without failure. So if we can fail fearlessly, we can fail faster, we can get to success faster. So that was our vision and now it's our culture, and that's just some of what we've done. Um, there's a lot more that we could touch on, but I, I also wanted to be able to present some stats about what this has enabled us to do. So I mentioned when delivery was, was born, we had maybe 30 services, three environments, we were doing two to four deployments a day. Today, we're doing about 1,000 containers on our production cluster, we're running 300 services, we've got about 20 different environments, and we're adding two new services to that inventory every week. We've had over 100 user sandboxes created, uh, 200 automated deployments daily. Um, and on the health and monitoring side, we've resolved most of them automatically uh, over 25,000 health events. And since delivery was born on November 17th, of last year, uh, we've done over 10,000 deployments with, with the platform, with Docker EE. Um, so, I mean, if, if you do your math, that's only about eight months, and that's, that's how far all these pillars have, have let us go. So, that's what we've been able to accomplish so far. Um, so, the real questions, what's next, because we should always be looking forward, and that's one of the things we wanted to enable. And, you know, um, lots of big announcements out of DockerCon this week, and uh, I know some of you that might be using EE, um, of course, Docker EE brought in Kubernetes uh, with their, their latest 2.0 release, um, so I, that's going to play a big role, but um, I'm going to let Sharon kind of talk about uh, some of the future state for what we've got going, and... Um, if we have if we have time, we'll we'll take some questions if anybody has them. Sure, absolutely. So actually, the only thing um, that all I mean there are well, there's a lot that we've got going on that we want to be doing, um, but we're going to take what we've learned and what we've done for the software side, and we're going to apply that on the data side. So I'm really excited. I've got a, a team in place where we're going to start to tackle that, and we're going to do our analytics in a continuous delivery fashion as well. And um, from a software side, we will be continuing to dismantle um, pieces and parts of our legacy and reimagine them, reimagine the business around those parts and um, just keep disrupting what we can. <laughs> That's all we got. So, do you guys have any questions? I don't know that we'll be able to see. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Sure. And, uh, Don, uh, if you guys have questions, there's a mic right back here. I'd ask you to um, walk over to the mic and kind of queue up there. <laughs> uh, we have time for a few questions. I have a couple if we run out of questions. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I think uh, it was quite insightful. Uh, and uh, additionally, the pace at which you have perhaps achieved uh, the elements that you showcased are uh, quite commendable. Uh, that said, uh, I have a few questions uh, that come in mind, and these are like interrelated. Uh, 
So first of all, when you started off on this journey and, and put together uh, the element of automation in terms of deployments, uh, so on and so forth, uh, right? So did you uh, build it grounds up or did you have uh, like, a, like a template or a product that you used to undertake uh, the deployment part? So what I mean by that is you said if a developer wants this environment, this component, uh, this part, he's able to choose that and then tie it together. And then there are a lot of elements that go into it, like the networks and DNS and the firewall ports and all of that getting aligned and that getting uh, you know, configured and provided to the uh, developer. So how did you go about doing it and what, what uh, technologies did you use or products did you use? Okay, well, that's a, that's a great question. So the, there's actually a wide array of mm -hmm. things that, that kind of went into that. So as a tool, it was written in, in Go. The API was written in Go. Um, the front end is all, all uh, TypeScript with Angular 4. And then as far as the other supporting technologies, um, you know, there's uh, some service discovery stuff that, that does run on our swarm um, that, that helps with things like endpoints and DNS and, and whatnot that way. Um, uh, it, it'd be really hard to get into all those now, and I'm more than happy to have that, that super deep dive technical talk. Um, yeah, I'm sure. But <laughs> I'm not... I'm <laughs> No, I understand I, what you mean. Uh, 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 so I just wanted to get a view. And uh, uh, considering all of that this was built, uh, there are two parts uh, in terms of people that I wanted to ask. So your project team that actually built all of this together, mm -hmm. uh, how, how large was the project team? It was two people. And in fact, we're both in the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, excellent. And she, she's not awesome. the other one, actually. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it was, no. It was two engineers, um, my, myself and then my uh, former colleague, Kevin Crawley, who's sitting in the audience over there. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. And, and they, they were actually in, embedded within the innovation team. And my team is um, cross-functional. Uh -huh. So I've got architects, I've got engineers, I've got front-end engineers, user experience product managers, um, and we had our, our DevOps. So we incubated the discipline uh, within for what we needed, and now we've actually, they've graduated to uh, the operations team because we're expanding on what we're doing. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was actually my next question around operations team. So, so I'm assuming that this you run 24-7 uh, in general because you may have teams that are spread out, so on and so forth. So, so you operate this 24-7, so it needs to be manned. I don't know, maybe 24/7. So, how, how large is your ops team, and how is it structured? Is it like in, is it blended with your legacy support team, or did you create a new team to specifically look at these elements? So, you're asking if the the old team is is helping support with the new stuff, or yeah. So, my my question is, say, some, suppose Swarm goes down. Right? Okay. What happens? So, our Who does it? yeah. We're we're kind of doing doing our stuff alongside, so we're bringing in um, more of the more of the legacy operations folks and developers. Um, what's been really interesting about that transition, because of what we've done, is we're we're not necessarily going to them and saying, "Hey, here's here's the new way we're going to do things. Here's the new platform you're going to operate on." They're coming to us and saying, "Hey, we we want to do that. Mm -hmm. We we want to be a part of that." Um, so it's made it's made the transformation within the company a lot easier. But initially, we, we stood up our team um, alongside what they were already doing. Um, so they, they helped us get some stuff started. Um, we, we got some processes and standards in place. And um, we've, we've been kind of managing uh, both the platform and the process ourselves. But, but now, now it's spreading like wildfire, and everybody's wanting to get in. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Yep. Thank you. Very great presentation. I'm wondering about how you continue to innovate when you, uh, once you've kind of got it to scale and how this is affecting the other operations teams that are maybe still supporting the, you know, kind of more legacy and traditional apps. Uh, the other operations teams are ecstatic. They can't wait to, to get the rest of their stuff dockerized because <laughs> they, uh, They've, you know, like I said, they've been they've been very involved in in this process so far. But um, most of that's been kind of helping us accomplish what we were wanting to do. And now, 
now they're going out and they're, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing that we do with our community leaders and our captains. They're being advocates for the platform and, and they're, they're helping everybody else move it over. So, I mean, there's still going to be some needs there, but the, the biggest thing we've seen shift with, with the operations team, um, uh, mostly has been kind of the mindset they, they use when they're, when they're working on something new or they're, they're building out new things. Um, you know, where they're, they, if they need to go build a new server, for example, they used to just hop into VMware or something and build it out and run the whole thing. They might, they might spend half a day on that. Where now they need to go build a new server. They're thinking about it from, from those pillars and they're like, well, let me see if I can simplify this and standardize it. And they're building, you know, Ansible playbooks to, to do it. So next time they get asked to do the same thing, they tweak a couple variables, they hit a button and, you know, that, that kind of culture kind of spreading through, through some of the legacy teams and organizations, um, you know, has, has made a big shift and big difference. Uh, did that answer your question? It did. Thank okay. you. Uh, one more question is um, you, you made a choice early on to build instead of buy some of your tools. And I'm wondering, now that it's been a while, you're looking back, you've got that retrospect, would you, did you make the right choice? I, I think given the options we had at the time, um, I, I truly believe that we did. The, the landscape changes so fast, though. So if we were posed with the same decision today, I'm, it'd, be, it'd be a harder sell. Um, but I, I think given what we were trying to do and how fast we were trying to do it, that, that we absolutely made the right, de right decision. Thanks. Yep. All right. Thank you again, Sharon and Don. <laughs> Thank you. If we can uh, get a big round of applause. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, there it is. <laughs> I think that they will be around uh, if there are any additional questions, if you want to just talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll over here or in the hallway. Yeah, we'll, we'll hang back for a little bit if anybody else had anything else they wanted to talk about.